Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion on powering next-gen applications with embedded graphs. My name is Meryl Lee, and I'm part of the webinar team here at Neo4j, and I'm joined by a very distinguished group of panelists today. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. We invite you to submit any questions you have throughout the presentation using the questions tab located at the top of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's session, and if we don't get to them all, someone from Neo4j will reach out to you directly, or you can send an email to webinar at neo4j.com and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. I also want to let you know that the session is being recorded. With that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dave Packer, who will be the moderator for today's discussion. Great, thank you, Marilee. Appreciate uh, the intro there. Um, Today's session on embedded graphs. I'm fortunate to have uh, three great panelists uh, with us today. Um, Justin Bursich um, from Lucinity, um, Ernie Ostick from Manta, and Kalen Chalmers from Capgemini. And you know, today's session is really about how organizations are re you know, invigorating, re-innovating, um, and creating. Um, technologies that leverage graph to provide better outcomes for their customers, um, really evolving where graph is going into their technology stack so that um, they can embrace the greatest in analytics, AI, machine learning technology, uh, and the rest to really help get ahead and, uh, again, help their customers solve uh, some really um, tenuous data challenges within the enterprise today. So with that, um, I want to first hand it off uh, through the panelists here, uh, let them introduce themselves, their companies and what they're doing today. So give everybody a little bit of context of uh, how they are building uh, with Graph and what they're doing. So I'll hand it off to you first, Justin. Great, thanks Dave. And thanks panelists, nice to meet you all and, and talk to Net 4 j again. Uh, so, my name is Justin Bursich, and I'm the head of AI here at Lucidity. Uh, we're based in Reykjavik, uh, with offices in Brussels, New York, and London. Uh, at Lucidity, we're really about improving our customers' defense against money laundering and fraud and other types of financial crime. Uh, my job is to really execute the artificial intelligence strategy that we have to really detect complex money laundering activities and, and other types of financial crime and bring them through to our customers and our clients so that they can investigate them further and actually determine whether these are relevant for uh, submitting to a regulator. Uh, so we see our mantra really at Lucinity is about making money good. You know, we wanna change the, the conversation around compliance so that as a society, we come together and actually tackle money laundering. And we see graphs and our partnership with new 4 j as a key part of that to really delve into complex transactional data and active data and find these really complex cases of money laundering that most you know, relational databases uh, find difficult to detect with it. So our business model is really around building what we call our human AI platform. And this is about synergistically bringing together the best of human intuition and creativity with the computational power of machines and, and building trust within one another. We see that when a human understands an artificial intelligence decision, that they gain more trust in that AI and they can actually feed back more information into it. And this manifests into our product. So our product's really about connecting with our clients, which are financial institutions, and, and connecting through our, our API. We have very much uh, customer-centric APIs where our clients ingest data into our platform. It's run through several behavioral AI detection models to detect different types of money laundering. Uh, and we also do a dynamic risk assessment where we look at actors uh, and customers of our customer and determine whether they're potentially conducting financial crime. And graphs really sit at the core of Lucinity. It's really about leveraging the you know, expressive power of graphs to find hidden relationships, to find you know, uh, illicit nodes, and to find bad actors and really help our clients bring that through to the regulators. And very importantly on our platform is our case management system. So anti-money laundering is uh, it's a very time intensive task. So compliance teams around the world spend a lot of time going through different alerts of, of money laundering activity that are being brought forward by systems. And we believe at Lucinity that uh, these people and these investigators need help. They need a hand. And you know, using graphs to actually show money laundering networks and to show you know, illicit actors, this is what really helps them co complete their job correctly, efficiently, and, and productively. And ultimately, everyone uh, together works well, and, and we can stop money laundering. So 
you know, Lucinity will really found it on this principle that graphs are the future. And this is, again, you know, basically our, our mantra that all information and all shared intelligence in our company is, is kept within a knowledge graph. Uh, and our knowledge graph is stored on near 4 gen What we do in our knowledge graph is, is basically hold all the, the regulations, compliance documents, all types of uh, money laundering regulations that are out there. We hold them within our, within our network, uh, within our graph, excuse me. And what we do is we use artificial intelligence algorithms to traverse through the graph to pick up that money laundering behavior and actually go and try and detect it in our customers. And when we raise a case of money laundering, uh, we can basically use graphs further to, as I said, investigate uh, the money laundering case and other elements of artificial intelligence like explainable art to actually show the investigator why we found this to be money laundering. So we see graphs as, as a key future part of, of lucidity and generally uh, a few, uh, the future of financial crime detection. Uh, and we're very happy to be partnered with Near4J and, and going on this mission together to make money good. So I'll hand it back to you, Dave. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Justin. And uh, next up, um, Ernie Ostick from uh, Manta. He's a, a senior vice president of product there. And uh, Ernie, tell us a little bit about uh, Manta and what you are all doing. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for all of the uh, other panelists and all of you for attending. Um, here at Manta, we provide a unified data lineage platform. And this platform is all about discovering how data is flowing through your enterprise, where it comes from, where it's going to, and what happens to it along the way. Um, we're very excited about uh, partnering with Neo4j because it's enhancing our ability to deliver this capability uh, and functionality to our customers. Ultimately, we help our customers achieve regulatory compliance and uh, enhance their governance activities and speed up the migration process, particularly if they're moving uh, database applications up into the cloud and shorten their delivery cycles in support of uh, data ops and really understanding the pipeline that they have uh, and how data is flowing and make sure that that pipeline stays reliable. We provide end-to-end -end lineage. Now, end-to-end -end lineage means encompassing all the processes in the organization, the places where data is, is dropped and stored, data warehouses, data lakes, data marts, the mainframe files that perhaps are getting processed through ETL tools, getting loaded into Hadoop, processed by stored procedures in Hive and other relational databases, maybe being placed up into the cloud and then being acted upon by business intelligence tools. And the ability to look at all of those relationships and how that data is flowing makes storing it in a graph incredibly important because there's so many relationships and they're very complex. But that's what we do in providing our customers the ability to view their lineage from end to end. How do we do that? Well, Manda actually goes through and looks at your code. We crunch through, we like to say, that code, whether it's um, SQL statements, whether it's the complex information in various ETL tools, <clears throat> or the metadata provided by reporting tools, um, such as Tableau and Cognos and ClickSense, uh, all these different offerings, and looking through that in detail, and then documenting the lineage along the way. How does this column flow into that table? How does this procedure read that particular one and load it somewhere else? Or how is it defined in a view? And finally, you know, out to the front ends where people need to actually trace that lineage uh, going upstream. And then we visualize that lineage with an interactive map, ultimately pulling that information from the graph database, but then displaying it so that it can actually navigate and look through all of these different procedures to drill down and see the individual transformations that are affecting my data and understand where it goes for many different use cases uh, as we outlined before, from compliance uh, through uh, actually supporting your up, uh, upward flows and, and keeping them uh, in production and rolling along. Thank you, Dave. Great, thank you, Ernie. Um, and, and lastly, um, Callum, uh, he is the uh, senior data scientist at Capgemini. And uh, tell us a little bit about your business and what you're doing there, Capgemini. Uh, thank you, David, um, and hello to uh, uh, the people on the panel. Uh, very nice to meet you. 
Um, so, yeah, as, as they've mentioned, uh, I'm a senior data scientist uh, within Capgemini. And uh, Capgemini, we're a global leader in consulting digital, uh, digital transformation, technology and engineering services. Uh, the group is at uh, the forefront of innovation to address the uh, entire breadth of clients' uh, opportunities in the, in the uh, evolving world of cloud, digital, and platforms. Um, Camp Gemini is guided every day by its uh, purpose of unleashing human energy through technology for an inclusive and sustainable future. We are a responsible and diverse organization of uh, some 270,000 uh, team members uh, spread across uh, 50 countries. I'm based here in the UK, uh, very lucky uh, to, to be up the road from the uh, birthplace of, of uh, William Shakespeare, a very nice part of the world. Um, with a strong 50-year heritage, of course, uh, and, and deep industry expertise, um, Capgemini is trusted by its clients to address the, the entire breadth of uh, business needs uh, from strategy and design to operations, uh, fueled by the um, fast evolving and innovative world of cloud, uh, data, AI, connectivity, software, digital uh, engineering platforms, uh, and of course, graphs, uh, which is uh, why we're all here today. Uh, thanks, Dave. Sure thing, and thank you, and thank, thank you all for uh, introducing yourselves and your companies. A lot of interesting things going on, for sure. Um, you know, let me start off by, you know, there's a lot of fascinating use cases that are obviously evolving. Uh, that graph is kind of opening the doors to new ways of approaching things. And Ernie, maybe start with you. Um, you know, you know, there's obviously a set of customer challenges, and then there's graph technology and kind of you know, the bread, you know, or what do you want to say, the, the pieces that come together or the stack you're building for your customers. And, you know, what, what you know, how are, are you, is it helping you address those challenges? And how is it different than what was there before, right? Because obviously some of these things aren't new. Uh, people were trying to do them before, maybe with other technologies or whatever. What, what, what's the big advancement that's happening to help you help address your customers' challenges? In particular, uh, you know, there's a couple of reasons why we went with Neo4j, but I would say perhaps the most significant is um, being conscious of the performance that we're going to need as our customers go from tens of millions of objects that they're trying to track in lineage to hundreds of millions or perhaps more objects than that. And performance is, is absolutely critical. You know, we go through this parsing and crunching mechanism that I mentioned and uh, then we have to load that information somewhere. And a big part of that whole function of parsing someone's environment uh, takes a long time uh, just for our own technology to be applied. So we want to shorten the time as much as possible to then make that information useful. So being able to load the graph as fast as possible is critical. Mm -hmm. But then that's only, that's only good to a point because now you have to turn around and take advantage of that and display it in that uh, uh, tooling that lets you examine the lineage up close. And so retrieval and search capabilities and being able to do those in an incredibly uh, performant fashion is important. So we anticipated uh, from our largest customers the kind of growth that they would have. Um, and this was our reason that we felt we needed to go with uh, a much more powerful um, underlying um, Chassis, if you will. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's yeah, interesting, you know, performance, performance scale, scale, all those things that all have an impact on the overall outcome at the end of the day. And, you know, like you say, you know, data growth is so extensive today, right? And so many different inputs coming into the business. And, you know, everybody's a data driven company today. So, Obviously, you know, the better that you get at managing the data, especially the lineage of it, which I can only imagine how complicated that must be uh, as businesses grow, and especially your clientele, right, which is financial and other companies uh, of the such. So, um, Justin, how about you? What, what's your take on, um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, heading up AI at Lucinity and, and being responsible for that machine learning, big technology that's been emerging for a few years now. It's taken a few years to get where it is. But uh, what's you, how, how does that question uh, pose to you in the sense of what you guys are doing? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. And, you know, I just want to 
just sort of re-emphasize as well what Ernie's saying with this huge amount of data coming onto platforms. You know, we're all used to it. We all know which direction the world's going in. And, you know, at Lucinity, for example, we can work for, with some customers with millions of transactions a day. And I think what's happened over the last couple of years is as, as AI, has, AI has advanced, you know, AI is really about respecting what's called the multidimensional nature of data that lots of different data points in our world connect in very complex ways to explain to explain things. And you know, if we look at a, a relational database or if we look at kind of the old, almost the old way of doing things, it's, it's more respect about, hey, here's a single data point and here's another data point. But we, we need to think about the connections. Now, when we, as AI advanced over the last couple of years, our customers were faced with the challenge of more and more data. So a single transaction uh, conducted at a bank, there may be 30, 40, 50, 100 different data points about that transaction. Now, you add the complexity of thinking about connections between different transactions, between different people, between different customers of, of banks and financial institutions, and, and this, this, this amount of data just explodes. So I actually think that the graphs are a way to actually simplify things. Uh, it's actually around, hey, we don't actually need to create this complexity. Let's put it into a graph and let's run the algorithms or the, or the, the queries or whatever that we need from the graph and extract that intelligence and, and those insights. And I think that's, the, that's a great innovation. We're going back to our roots of, of kind of simplicity, um, but the power of, of building brilliant intelligence from it. So, you know, at Lucinity, it's really about our customers' challenges. Yeah, we want to empower them to to fulfill their compliance function. You know, compliance is a difficult task. Uh, you know, banks spend a significant amount of, amount of money on compliance. And generally, it's not you know, the easiest, it's not a cost center of a, uh, it's, it's more a cost center of a bank than a revenue generator. And, um, you know, empowering these guys with the tools to really perform their jobs is key. <laughs> and graphs really help us and, and help us go those extra steps to build the, the actionable intelligence and insights that they need to do their job. So, uh, it's a key part, and, and it's actually very exciting to see the trajectory and growth over the next few years. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, you know, I want to double click on some the comment you made. I will after I, I you know let you get Colin Collins uh, input on this, but you know the, the ease element. Obviously, it's interesting when you think about you know transitioning to graph and going that direction, and uh, you know the simplicity it could introduce, but it can also seem like. It's not simple at the same time. So I, I want to come back to that. But uh, Callum, what, what, uh, in your world, uh, how, how do you see the, um, both the uh, you know, customer challenges and utilizing graph to you know, really drive success for them? And, and, and how has that changed your orientation into what's happening? I, th I think um, I, I agree with, uh, um, with what both uh, Ernie uh, and Justin have said. But I, I guess just to kind of really pick up uh, the one thread uh and that's uh, for, for me or on come gemini it's really been you know it's really about the in interconnectedness of data um and data relationships um obviously data volume and data quantity is certainly uh, one issue but uh, for me it's really that uh, uncovering you know relationships uh, that uh, were, were perhaps hidden so yeah a good example to my mind is you know obviously you, you know we've all been affected by uh, you know the COVID nineteen pandemic, and, and you know uh, clients have been trying to solve a, a wide range of, uh, of issues related to that. Um, uh, and I guess uh, an obvious um, challenge that that, that that has caused is you know obviously healthcare issues. Um, but it's not just healthcare; it's like there's also logistical issues. You know, it's getting the resources uh, to the right place, as uh, you know, vaccines and, and so on. Um, and and so all these connections, it's, it's not just about uh, healthcare per se, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's all the, the follow on uh, issues. Um, it, it, we also see very similar threads to that, obviously, you know, when uh, detecting fraud, um, you know, fraud and financial crimes are obviously, uh, it's all interconnectedness, you know, relations between people, you know, who's, who's leading a criminal gang. Um, who, who's uh, you know posing a say a security threat? Is it uh, who they know, where they've been to as well? You know, um, or what communication channels that have people been involved with? Um, you know, uh, and I guess you know, you, you know um, following the money uh, is another 
uh, issue uh, that's all, you know, all to do with it, the whole interconnectedness of, of data. Mm. I, I think uh, another slight spin uh, on on it is also um, uh, perhaps something that uh, we don't think about enough of is you know the uh, the time dimension of of data. Um, you know the, the kind of the, the temporal uh, nature of of, of, of how uh, data and graphs uh, evolve, evolve over time. Um, so we're certainly seeing uh, clients um, faced with uh, challenges in predicting modern future events. It's not just about the here and now. It's you know what's coming up. Um, so and so again, you know, using COVID uh, as an example, it's you know. Um, Modeling, you know, future outbreaks potentially, or, or you know, modeling um, the the transportation of, of vaccines from one country to another country, and, and so on. Um, so th th those are the sort of issues that we're seeing. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, especially COVID. Obviously, you know, Neo4j has been utilized a lot from a graph perspective in helping to kind of map out, you know spread and all sorts of interesting, uh, you know, research use cases and things like that, which has been fascinating. You know, I think sometimes when you're, you know, in a technology company, you always want to see techno your technology being used for the good of improving the world somehow, right? And that's definitely been an area where it's been fantastic to just kind of see some of the things that have fundamentally helped companies, you know, make a difference and do, especially under the COVID uh, crisis. And so, um, you know, just I want to come back to you on the conversation we just had a moment ago. And, um, you know, one thing that obviously, uh, you know, developers as folks like yourself, you know, you're building, you know, is the ease of graph, right? Like, um, you know, it's it, at first your introduction might seem almost intimidating, right? And then there's like, well, you know, I've got to learn how to use it and embed it into my system and develop on it. Like, Tell me a little bit about your experience there, and and um, you know what was that like, like bringing in uh, Neo4j and working with it, and kind of getting up to speed and, and learning about graph and, and all those pieces. Yeah, it's it's very it's been a great experience, a very interesting experience. Uh, it is a very interesting technology to first encounter. Uh, mm -hmm. The concept of nodes and relationships being its fundamental elements. Uh, and then what can we do from that? Where can we go from that? And uh, the fact that I think Neo4j has, um, both with Cypher as the query language, both with how relatively easy it is to integrate data in, uh, has made that experience actually quite enjoyable. Uh, I think the data integration into Neo4j is, uh, from, a, from a developer perspective, from a data engineer perspective, you, 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 you have an easier and you have a more rational way of dealing with and building up your data that you ingest into your database than you do with a relational database. You, of course, in a relational database, you have your, your data points, your connections, but in a graph, you're actually looking at, you know, uh, a behavior or, or basically a reality in a way uh, and how everything connects. And, uh, you know, in terms of experience of connecting, uh, there's always complexities with how data is held. We hold, you know, through our APIs, our, our data model ingests very well into Neo4j and very efficiently. Um, and as well through basic, you know, table or, or CSV imports or things like that, it's also very, very easy to connect. But I think what, what sets Neo4j apart a little bit is the ease of queries and the speed of queries deep into graphs. So, you know, especially from a data science perspective and from a money laundering perspective, we're interested in very deep uh, criminal networks. You know, sometimes you'll see a transaction go around the world 200 times uh, and end up in a bank in Panama. And you know, that's the transaction that you need that, that can trace back all the way to a criminal ring. And you know, the ability to actually ingest all this data through, and, and as Callum said, around the, the temporal component, um, to ingest it over time and actually see how the data uh, develops over time and to pinpoint those criminal, criminal networks uh, is actually very, very interesting and, and obviously enjoyable experience to to help clean up the financial system. So um, I would say all our developers enjoy working with it, uh, especially Aura. Aura is you know very easy to easy to pull, very easy to scale up, scale down. Um, but but in essence, it, it has been that that new approach to thinking uh, nodes and relationships that that's changed obviously from from how things were done. So yeah. 
Oh, that's great. It's really uh, it's inter- interesting because I, I know even my own experience when I first learned about graph, I was thinking, how do I get my head around it or initially, right? And that's a, uh, but I also find that the amount of resources out there and everything else really made it easy to kind of like shift that thinking, almost like going from procedural program to object oriented programming. There's always that first hurdle, but once you cross it, then you're like, oh, why would I have done it the other way? <laughs> right. So, uh, how about you, Cal? What's your, what's your take on that? And kind of like, obviously, you're working with a lot of different customers, a lot of different use cases, building a lot of different, helping build a lot of different kind of uh, stacks and technology uh, solutions. So, uh, how, how about your teams? Um, so, I and mean, for me personally, um, I've, uh, I absolutely love um, uh, Cypher and and sort of graph technology. I think that comes back to my sort of mathematical days. Uh, I, I, I loved graph theory when I was at university. Uh, so it, it was nice to actually, it, it was nice to kind of see, you know, those sort of abstract concepts, you know, that are written in deep mathematical prose kind of, you know, it really translated to you know, a visual, a very visual thing. Um, uh, so for me, you know, it, it was very nice. But I guess, um, one of the things we love about, uh, I guess, graph modeling and uh, designing, I guess, as it were, you know, the schema, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, is, you know, it, it, you just take a whiteboard, you, you draw out, you know, how, how, how the relationships in between, uh, you know, entities uh, exist. And that is, your, that, that is your data model. So, yeah, it's very easy to, uh, to build uh, data models uh, with uh, Neo4j or, or with draft databases uh, more generally. Um, uh, the visuals are also very powerful. Uh, I mean, graph visuals, um, uh, whether it's you know through uh, Neo4j's uh, Bloom um, visualization platform, or uh, of course you know, be, uh, you partner with them as well. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the the platform from Linkurious, um, you know, that's a great visualization uh, as well. Uh, so we've been using that uh, for uh, a number of uh, use cases. Um, so I guess yeah, um, it's uh, it's been a joy to work with actually. Uh, nice to see uh, in action. Yeah, great, well, it's great to hear. How about you, Ernie? I know you and I when we first met, uh, you you. Uh, spent some time explaining to me your kind of developers and kind of their embracing graph and everything. Like, what's that experience been there with, with your team? Well, you know, interesting. We actually made the uh, transition to go with graph a uh, good, good number of years ago now uh, from relational uh, because clearly in this area of metadata management and lineage, just the number of relationships is, you know, overwhelming. And graph was clearly the way for us to go, um, you know. And then doing our analysis on our customers and where they're headed, we just realized that the open source graph choice that we had made several years ago, which was good at the time, uh, was not going to, you know, meet the needs of our uh, customers and how they're growing right you know, right now. And you know, I think to go back to the you know ease of graph, I, you know, I'll point to uh, our engineering's discussions about the ease and maturity in particular of the Neo4j uh, portfolio. The extensive, and, you know, graph is, is out there, but the extensive networks that are available, not just with Neo4j teams themselves who have supported us wonderfully, but just overall uh, within the industry um, that are, you um, talking about the techniques they have with Neo4j, providing support for those things that we need. And what does that do? That translates into faster time of value for us to get to a full Neo4j implementation, but also promises a whole lot more things in confidence that we can support our customers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that's critical as well. Mm -hmm. What what kind of difference has like the community made for you all? I mean, you know, obviously, somewhere around 200,000 developers out there in the, in the, in the community. Has, has that been super assistive to your team there, Ernie? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, they remarked how they were easily able to get answers, even if, you know, 
time zones weren't exactly cooperative uh, and and there's always new advice and wisdom that comes from some creative solution right that a, that a neo4j customer happens to be playing with uh, that may just be uh, another creative way of implementing an API uh, mm -hmm. or a particular model mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, you know one area that's you know obviously interesting is um, kind of where do you see graph going? And you know, there's all these you know uh, bets about you know graph you know it's going to be the next big database and it's going to dominate just because of a lot of the things you folks have talked about, you know, growth of data, machine learning, you know, all these different use cases. And I think also just a lot of use cases companies discover as they start using graph more and more, right? Um, like, you know, earning from your standpoint, um, where do you see graph going? Like, how do you see it maturing over the next, you know, five years? And, and do you, how do you see that affecting the whole data landscape out there? I've been impressed by the uptake of a broader set of users. You know, going back a ways, those of us that like to tinker, uh, certainly the deep engineers that all of us have within our organizations uh, were certainly, you know, starting to use Graph because they saw its popularity. Um, but it's getting out to uh, a greater population. Now, um, you know, exactly what methods people use uh, for doing queries against the Graph database, it was everybody ready for that? Uh, maybe not yet, but maybe as that part of it matures, mm -hmm. we'll start to see uh, a larger number of users perhaps getting towards the more less technical that are feeling comfortable of diving into the graph with, with obviously tools that are, um, you know, going alongside of it. But I would say that that's probably the, the biggest thing I'm seeing is that the audience for uh, accessing the graphs is enlarging. Right. Well, I think especially in the last year, there's been quite the shift uh, that we've seen just in adoption and interest. And, uh, you know, as data science keep, continues to mature, that, that area, we see a huge increase in interest from data scientists and on graph and everything else. How about you, Callum? How do you see kind of the next few years and where graph is maturing to? I think, um, I, I don't think it was only, I mean, we're seeing obviously a massive uh, uptick in, uh, you know, clients just being interested uh, in, in, in graphs. Um, uh, and, and clients that are using graphs that also, you know, really begin to push the boundaries of, of what graphs can do. Uh, you know, the, the kind of use cases become much more, um, much more developed, uh, much more complex, uh, you know, the, particularly with the, you know, the integration of AI uh, and ML um, techniques and so on. Um, we're not, I mean, in terms of how I see, you know, the craft databases or the sector moving uh, in future, I think one of the things that perhaps has been a hindrance to some clients um, adopting graphs a bit more is that, you know, I mean, Okay, I mean, technically there are, you know, uh, you know three graph models, uh, but let's put hypergraph and, you know, other complications to the side. But, you know, we really have, you know, the property graph model, you know, sort of Neo4j and, you know, uh, and others, of course, in that sector. Um, and then we have, you know, the, um, the resource description uh, framework or, or RDF graphs. And it's that, you know, what graph model... Uh, you know, should be adopted uh, for particular use cases. I and mean, often they're seen as you know, kind of competing uh, mm -hmm. models in some sense, uh, the different uh, strengths and weaknesses. And, and you know, historically, maybe they've been viewed uh, as having different use cases. Uh, with RDF graphs, you know, they've historically been used for, you know, data understanding, mm -hmm. data exchange, uh, semantics, and so on. And, you know, labeled property graphs, uh, they were designed for, you know, fast querying, storage, uh, with, you know, key strengths of fast graph calculations, uh, great use cases or problems that involve, you know, transactional data and so on. Um, but I think, so there, there is, uh, you know, which models kind of best uh, for clients. 
I know we are seeing developments of you know the RDF star schema or RDF RDF star model, um, and so we're kind of seeing perhaps a blurring of the lines uh, between RDF and property. Uh, and I wonder whether you know you said five years, five years hence from now. Uh, I would say maybe ten years hence. You know, will we'll we make a distinction between the two craft models? Uh, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard one to call. Um, but certainly, uh, I think that's been a hindrance to some to some people understanding the, the different types of models. Mm. Interesting point. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one because I think there are, you know, different techs, uh, different ways you can approach it and different models. And it's all, not always easy to attach like what I'm trying to do and what is the right model and bringing that together. But yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine at some point you would have kind of like a, you know, Uber model, right? That takes over, you know, that that can be used in both, um, you know, both worlds. But what, what's your take, Justin? And, and like, I'm also interested, just like, you know, what do you see is really driving the interest to, right? You know, are people just stumbling on graph? Is there something in particular that's really making it uh, uh, more interesting to folks and um, seeing wider adoption? Yeah. So. There's no doubt that we're seeing these conversations more and more. You know, our customers are actually actively coming to us talking about graphs. Uh, and that's happened at all different levels, at the engineering level, at the, the compliance level, at the boardroom level. So here's one take on it. Uh, especially from a de developer perspective, there's kind of little bits and pieces in it for everyone, right? So let's just start at the, at the top. You, you can develop a, a, the UI level. You can develop a beautiful interface. Uh, we've mentioned a few libraries, but in essence, when you see a graph in there for Jake Bloom or whatever type of technology it's in, you automatically you, 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 you just automatically understand what's happening. It takes a little bit of time to get your head around it, but you, you see that there is um, an environment, a world that is tangible, controllable, and you can actually spend your time trying to understand. The graph shows you what is. And then if you, you go back through, you know, through an organization, through a developer team, you, you have bits and pieces in there for the engineers, right? It's an interesting technology. It's a, it's a big shift from, from your traditional databases. And that in itself is very interesting and innovative to work with. You know, a lot of relational databases have been around for 20, 30 years plus, and some of the technology has kind of gone into a degree of stasis. So graphs represents an ability to, to kind of use these new technologies. Uh, and then you get right into the deep end, into the data science realm or the AI realm. And I will say that one of one of the great, uh, it's a great feeling when you run, a, run, run an algorithm for the first time, um, you know, some type of graph data science algorithm, and you can automatically detect something that you just know you couldn't find uh, in, a, in a relational database. Or if you had built 100 features and a brilliant neural network or whatever type of model, it was just too difficult to find and too complex. So I think when data scientists start to use graph data science tools like you know, community detection, link analysis, and, and different types of algorithms, uh, you straight away start to extract you know, intelligence and insights that you know you can't get elsewhere, or it's very difficult to replicate. Uh, and I think where we're going, so I really want to touch on Callum's point around the temporal element of data. And I, I, I personally see this as the most interesting uh, one of the most interesting directions I think new, uh, graphs uh, and graph neural networks um, will go, go in. So, you know, a graph neural network is really about uncovering you know, hidden relationships that, that aren't so evident in a graph, using a, using a neural network to actually detect and, set and predict where a relationship may be um, that, that's not so evident, or a node that, for example, may be illicit, or a node that may be um, any type of you know, supervised learning uh, problem. So. Yeah. The, the current graph neural networks and graph data science techniques are quite interesting. But I think where the next four years and five years and the, the future is going to go is to really develop these prediction models of how graphs are going to transform through time. So if we start to see a certain graph build in a, uh, in way, in a, you know, in, in a certain, uh, uh, in some direction, where do we predict to be in three months, six months? How do we expect behavior to change? Mm -hmm. This is, I think, key for solving a lot of problems, you know, supply chain. COVID, um, you know, vaccine distribution, things like this. Uh, how do all these complicated, you know, inter but, but complicated but interconnected uh, variables um, come together to explain what is happening now and how we think things are going to actually transform into the future? So that right. to me is really, really the future. 
That's interesting. I mean, nobody can predict when a ship's going to get stuck in the Suez Canal, right? And (laughs) and how it's going to impact the supply chains on a global level. It's pretty interesting to read just like how many companies were panicking, uh, waiting for that ship to get uh, freed up. But, uh, you know, I'm looking at the time and uh, we need to kind of shift over to just some of the questions that have come in. Um, And, you know, just for, before I do that, though, are there any any other highlights anybody wants to mention? Is there anything that uh, you know, based on the conversation so far? Nope. Okay, that's fine. That's good. Uh, it means we've covered a lot of good points. Perfect. Um, so you know, let me go into the questions here really quick. And you know, uh, one person asked, uh, you know, SQL versus you know graph languages. You know, obviously there's you know, Cypher, Gremlin, GQL, which is an upcoming standard. Um, you know, wh- like, how has that been, like that transition uh, in learning uh, in that standpoint? Um, any any of you want to go first or talk about that for a second? I would suggest that uh, it's offered our engineers the ability to do kinds of analysis of the nodes and edges that mm-hmm. just weren't this either weren't possible in, in from a SQL perspective mm-hmm. or would have been the most insane queries that it would, <laughs> it would have just taken forever. And maybe you could create a model that would work for one query, but mm-hmm. it's not going to work for the next query. And, and that was significant. You know, uh, being able to follow and look at the relationships or even look at nodes that have no relationship. Uh, is extremely important uh, for our customers. And I don't think we just, you know, couldn't have easily delivered that on a relational platform. Yeah. I think, I think my experience of um, you know, the sort of SQL versus uh, well, Cypher, I guess, um, I actually think learning Cypher um, to, to be actually much easier uh, than SQL. Um, you know, with Cypher, it's you know, it's a, it's a query language that's, that, that's actually very visual uh, in nature. And you know, the syntax is, is that kind of that ASCII R almost. Um, you've got that text-based uh, visual uh, visual representation. Um, so I mean, that makes the language very easy to to write, uh, very easy to read uh, for, for others as well. Uh, when you're working in you know uh, teams. Um, and it's visually and structurally represents that the data uh you know very well so you, you know, the way you, you put your arrows uh you, you know represents uh, and, and reflects the, the direction of the relationships in, in reality uh, mm-hmm. so uh, actually I, I think it's um for me uh, it's a nicer language uh, as well it's like more intuitive that way yeah. Right? Yeah. So, how about you justin no, I think just the same. It's it's intuitive, and and like Callum says, it's almost like your your uh, you know, your cipher code is almost a representation of what your graph's going to look like. You can see you can see the graph forming as you're writing as you're yeah. writing your query. So, uh, to be honest, um, you know, a lot of the last uh, five to ten years, in my experience working, you know, more so with Python and pandas and machine learning type um, data frame um, libraries. You know, SQL is something that is, of course, useful for for your queries. But um, you know, it's 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 becoming more and more about doing your queries to bring in the right data so that you can perform your machine learning, as yeah. opposed to just writing your whole suite uh, SQL query. So it, it is the same with Cypher, and it just it just aids the machine learning process to get the data in correctly and in. Mm-hmm. And, and do you all see it? A, you know, it's kind of continues to one question. You know, like relational databases versus graph databases it you know coexisting one taking over the other uh, you know do, do you see a point in time where you know graph databases might dominate over relational databases um, it's an interesting question because it's it actually has come up in other conversations I've had with folks um, thoughts on that I think um, I mean it's certainly got to be recognized that there has been you know consistent growth uh, in the adoption of graph databases uh, over the past decade or so. And, you know, there's been various, you know, Gartner reports and predictions, you know, by, by, by other commentators, you know, as to, you know, graph being, uh, you know, the uh, yeah, a real tech uh, innovation and so on. Um, that said, I think it's fair to say, it's not in my view, that 
uh, graph databases are still seen as a bit niche. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're quite some way of seeing graph databases replacing SQL. Um, I, I think ultimately, we might, I, I, I think we've seen them sit more side by side. In time. I, I don't think we'll ever get to a point where one will necessarily replace the other. I think, I think they solve different problems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, I, I think it's very, I think you use the right tool for the right problem, mm -hmm. is my view on it. Yeah, I think mean, definitely we see today a lot of coexisting, you know, hey, I've, I've got these, uh, you know, uh, particular problems I'm trying to solve this way. You know, my relational database, you know, tables, rows works perfectly because I don't need to really mine it or understand the context that well. It's just high transaction stuff versus, you know, hey, we really need to understand the deeper layers of information here, right, and understand what's happening and what that means to our business and even find kind of like the unknown unknowns, right, and the trends and things that are there. That are there. Um, you know, Ernie, you know, from your standpoint, um, you know, how about for your customers and, and they're, you know, using your technology before we kind of close out here and ask this of each of you, just like, it, has there been a lot of like wow moments, like where your customers are, are like, wow, this is completely different than we had originally anticipated the outcome on it to be? Absolutely. I mean, it and kind of even uh, blends into the previous discussion because legacy stuff never goes away. And we have customers who are doing bleeding edge things with new kinds of databases in storage in the cloud. And guess what? They still have COBOL on their mainframe <laughs> with vSAM IMS databases. And there's lots of reasons for that, you know, economical and if it works, don't don't break it, that kind of thing. Uh, but the reality is, is that they're moving data from place to place. And there was no way to easily understand this in a fa quick fashion. And that's probably the biggest eye opener for our customers, regardless of their use case, right? Whether it's um, regulatory compliance or it's, oh my gosh, the, the warehouse you know, didn't get loaded and I've got a screaming executive who needs his report. Whatever the use case that drives it, trying to find out what the lineage was, was impossible. It was phone calls and emails and running down the hallway and someone's on vacation and, oh, we don't know where that code is. And it would take days, sometimes weeks, or people would give up. And, you know, Lineage and, you know, the platform that uh, the graph is helping enable lets them get that answer extremely quickly, regardless of what the use case. That's significant in changing people's behavior and, uh, you know, how they support themselves and their customers. Yeah. How about you, Justin? Yeah, so. I think we've had a very positive experience, especially as you as you go through the kind of a POC phase with a customer. Uh, they'll see things that they didn't expect to see. Uh, and it's the same thing with our data science team and our AI team. It's really about, hey, there is this unique feature that's helping us detect this specific type of money laundering, and we can pull it out of the graph with this query. And it's something that it's kind of a light bulb moment to say, hey, it is just this query. It's not these hundred features or this complex model. It is really just about looking at this relationship. and. And I guess I just want to highlight that, yeah, for us, lucidity is really about behavioral detection. It's really about, you know, finding money laundering behavior. And graphs are the perfect tool to both show behavior and to find behavior. Um, and for that, you know, that's that helps both our customers and our team, you know, attain better better outcomes for, for our clients. So um, now that's been a very positive experience. And obviously, everyone enjoys the, the visualizations. Yeah, well, that's great. And, and Callum, how about you? Close it off with your uh, your take on that. Uh, no, I absolutely echo uh, the comments uh, made there uh, by uh, Justin and, and Ernie. Um, I, I think for for uh, for a lot of clients, you know, there's been that sort of eureka moment when uh, graphs are so visual, you know, um, and because they're so visual, they're accessible to. You know, not just the you know the, the technical ex experts and the data scientists, but you know you can you, you can present uh, and show uh, essentially a graph database you know through the visuals to almost any stakeholder. You know, but you would never do that with a relational database. So you, you wouldn't show you know uh, you know a senior executive or or whatever you know a, a bunch of tables right. um, with relational. Databases, you know, you've got to tie them into, you know, some sort of 
you know, uh, BI platform or, or, or whatever uh, to to extract some sort of insights and, and so on. And uh, but with, with graphs, you don't have to do that. You, you know, obviously you can do that as well. But you know, you, you, graphs are. We, we live in a visual world. You know, we are visual people. Um, uh, so I think I think that's really the sort of eureka moment uh, for a lot of people uh, to to see it to see it visually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it was great insights. Really enjoyed the conversation with all three of you. Uh, you know, uh, thank you for uh, taking uh, part in today's panel on, uh, you know, embedded. And, you know, what, what does that mean to people who are developing and really providing their customer solutions and, you know, integrating graph into it. So I just want to thank you all. And uh, we'll just kind of end it here. Appreciate it. And thank you for everybody who attended uh, today's uh webinar and um, look forward to chatting with you all sometime soon in the future. Right. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye.